Hi everybody! In this fourth episode, we'll learn together how to customize the operation of a DCC decoder through its configuration variables. In the previous episode, we built a simple DCC decoder with Arduino, which can turn two LEDs on and off according to the commands it receives from the command station. If we give a look at the source code we wrote, we can see how everything is defined statically. The outputs to which we connected the LEDs, the operating mode, and even the address, for in my case, assigned to the decoder. To change the configuration of the decoder, we must therefore modify the sketch. This means that after a change, the decoder must be reprogrammed by connecting it to the computer. If this doesn't seem like a big program for an accessory decoder, think if the same applies to a multifunction decoder installed in a locomotive. Fortunately, the DCC standard comes to our aid, defining a decoder operating mode called Service Mode, whose purpose is to allow the customization of a digital decoder. The standard requires that the configuration and test operations of a decoder take place on a dedicated track, isolated from the rest of the layout. The current available on this track is limited to 250 mA, to avoid the risk of damaging the decoder in case of wiring errors or short circuits. Normally, digital command stations have a dedicated output, often called programming track. You connect a piece of track to each and position on this the locomotive to be programmed. In case of accessory decoders, it is also possible to connect the decoder directly to this output. Let's go back for a moment to the first episode of this tutorial, in which we used the motor shield as a booster for our Arduino DCC++ command station. The motor shield has two outputs, labeled A and B. DCC++ uses output B as programming output. But how is it possible to customize the operation of a decoder? Each decoder provides parameters whose values can be changed in service mode. These parameters are called CVs, or configuration variables. Each CV is characterized by a number and a value. In the first example, you see that CV1 has the value 143. A decoder can have up to 1024 different CVs. Each CV has the size of one byte, so it can take values from 0 to 255. The DCC standard indicates for each CV its meaning. It also specifies which ones are mandatory, that is, they must be implemented in each decoder, which ones are recommended, and which ones are optional. Let's scroll down through the table shows in the standard about accessory decoders. For the purpose of this video, we are interested in discovering that the range ranges of CVs, defined as manufacturer unique, available to individual manufacturers. This means that, for example, we can use CVs 33 to 81 to store specific configuration of our decoder. Until now, we have always seen DCC communication working in one direction only, from the command station through the booster to the decoder. To allow the command station to read the value of a CV or to have confirmation that a writing operation has been successful, the DCC standard provides that the decoder can also communicate with the command station by generating a knowledge pulses. To generate an ACK pulse, the decoder must draw at least 60 mA for 6 ms from the programming track. Typically, multifunction decoders generate the ACK pulses by briefly activating the locomotive motor. This is why sometimes, during programming, you can see the locomotive making small movements. To allow our accessory decoder to generate ACK pulses, the DCC interface I created uses an optocoupler connected to an Arduino pin to activate a transistor. When the Arduino pin is high, the transistor conducts and current can flow through resistor R4. 
Now let's see how to implement the service mode with the NMRA DCC library. Let's start by dealing with the generation of the ACK pulses. First, we choose the pin we want to use and connect it to the ACK input of the DCC interface or shield. I will use pin 6. Let's resume our sketch and define the new pin, declaring it as output. Whenever the library needs to generate an ACK pulse, it calls the notify CVAC callback function. We then implement the function. We must activate the pin for at least 6 milliseconds. In my test, I saw that it is better to reach at least 8 milliseconds to communicate correctly with all the command stations. The NMRA DCC library automatically manages some CVs. These few lines in our sketch are enough to communicate with the command station. Don't believe it? Let's try! This is the command station of the first episode, connect output B to our decoder. Open the decoder pro application of the JMRI suite. Power up the track and open the single CV programmer function. Through this function, we can read or write a single CV. Among the mandatory CVs, we find the CV7, which contains the decoder version, and the CV8, which contains the manufacturer's ID code. Do they remind you of anything? That's right, these are the parameters we passed to the init method. Let's try to read the values of the two CVs through Decoder Pro. As you can see, everything is correct, version 1 and manufacturer code 13. Last test. Let's change the version and try to read CV7 again. Here the value has been correctly updated. Let's now learn how to manage other CVs. The NMRA DCC library is able to automatically manage CVs, taking care of read-write operations and store the values in a non-volatile memory so that they are kept even if the decoder is turned off. This is the standard mode of operation. In our sketch, we only have to use the getCV and setCV methods if we want to read or modify the value of a CV. Alternatively, we can decide to manage the CVs by implementing the callback functions. For simplicity, today we see the first mode. The user, through two CVs, can change the working mode of the decoder, from be stable, one of the two LEDs always on, to impulsive. When in this second mode, the user can also indicate the duration of the impulse. We therefore need two CVs. We will use a CV40 to choose the working mode and CV41 for the duration of the pulse. We define that a value of 0 means be stable mode and a value of 1 means pulse mode. Let's modify the callback method to implement the new behavior. We take this opportunity to make the address dynamic too. The library provides the getAdder method to obtain the current address, stored in the CVs. We read the CV40 value. If we are in be stable mode, the code is already the one written. If, on the other hand, we are in impulse mode, we activate the output but only for the time specified in CV41. It is very important to define default values for CVs and the address. However, if we put these values in the setup, at each restart they would overwrite the programming. The DCC standard requires that writing any value to the CV8 triggers a factory reset of the decoder. We have a callback function for this event. The notify CV reset factory default. In this function, we are going to store the default values using the setCV methods. At the moment, the library does not have a dedicated address method, so we have to write by hand in CV1 and 9 to set 1 as the default address. Let's check if everything works. First, we write a value in CV8 to activate the factory reset. Then, we read the values of CV40 and 41. Let's try to send the commands to the decoder using the turnout control function. We need to connect the decoder to the output A.
the decoder behaves as in the previous video. Let's modify CV40 by activating the pulse mode. As you can see, the behavior of the decoder has changed. We were therefore able to configure it by programming the CVs. I also leave you to try to change the duration of the impulse through CV41. Thanks for watching! At the end of this video, we learn together how to build the three fundamental elements of a digital layout Command Station, Booster, and Decoder. There is still a lot to explore. Write me in the comments what would you like to know more. See you soon and have fun!